Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is my pleasure to welcome you in today. For those of you that don't know, my name is Dustin Pruitt. And I'm the location leader uh, for the Winchmore Hill location of Restore Family of Churches. Uh, I said that in a very weird way, but welcome in. Thank you so much for clicking in with us today. No matter where you are on the timeline, no matter where you are on the planet, here you are, and I'm so thankful you did, because I get to continue on in this series of The Spirit Speaks, uh, which is coming out of the word that we feel like God has given restore for this year, for this season that we're in, out of Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. And we we're, feel like we're at the part where the God commanded Ezekiel to, to prophesy to the breath, to fill these bones with life. And so the, the pneuma, the spirit, the breath of God to fill us and the spirit to speak to us. And, and that's where we are. We, we've covered a, a couple things already. And today we're going to be talking about a, a big one, maybe a nitty gritty one. This is one that I feel like divides some people, that weirds some people out, that, that makes them scared, that makes them like, oh, I don't want a part of that. That's just strange. And that's tongues and interpretation. So it's my joy to bring that to you today. So let's dive right into the Bible. We're going to start here in Acts chapter 2. And then later on, we're going to be going to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But we're starting in Acts chapter 2. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem. There were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. There was a festival going on at this time. So Jews from around the world came in to celebrate this festival. So they were from all over. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language spoken. We're going to jump to Acts chapter 10 now, starting in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they had heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And lastly, in Acts chapter 19, it says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit which kind of just blows my mind to take for granted for them. They're like, we, we know God, the creator of the universe, Yahweh that, that the Jews believe. We know Jesus, the Messiah that was prophesied, who came and died for our sins. We got that locked down. What's this Holy Spirit business, Paul? And Paul asked them, then what baptized did you receive? They replied, John's baptism. Then Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And I think this is so cool. This is something that had not really happened before. That in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would rest on people. That's the language that was used. It, was, it would rest on the prophets to give God's word to the people. Now this is the Spirit fills them. They're baptized, surrounded, covered, filled with the Spirit of God. And now what I'm going to point to today is the tongues part of it. That when the Holy Spirit comes, people speak in tongues. That, that speaking in tongues is a byproduct of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But I want to be very specific here. It is not the byproduct. It is a byproduct. 
Now, in the book of Acts alone, there's 22 instances of people coming to know Jesus or knowing Jesus and then being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the books of Acts of those 22, only three times does it talk about those people being filled and then speaking in tongues. So it's a byproduct. It's not the capital T, capital B, the byproduct. And so we're going to jump in to 1 Corinthians now. Actually, before I even go that far, uh, most preachers will come out or teachers will come out. These are my three main objectives for the day. So you write your, your, your three headings for your notes, and these are the things I really want you to remember. But I want to start off for three things. If you have it in your brain, I want you to unremember it. And if you don't have it in your brain, I want you to block it out to where it can't gain root. So these are three what I feel are false teachings when it comes to tongues. And number one is that if you do not speak in tongues, you do not have the Spirit of God. Now, I, I know that's a double negative statement there, but basically you can't be filled with the Spirit if you don't speak with tongues. That you're, oh, you don't speak in tongues? Oh, you're, you're just a junior Christian. You, you, you've not reached my level yet. You're just the second class. So I'm, the rest of us are first class. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. That's not in there. You are beloved by God. It's not their beloved and their most beloved. We're all loved by God. We're not first and second class here. Second thing I want us to get out of our brain is that this is the extreme part here. And this might be my American upbringing that when I was a teenager and I got saved and I came to know Jesus, I was a part of a Pentecostal church in the far reaches of Pentecostal church and their beliefs is that if you don't speak in tongues, you aren't even saved. That you aren't going to heaven unless you speak in tongues. And that's not true. Once again, that's not in the Bible. That's not in there. That's not God. So let's take that out of our our brain. Lastly, the third thing, that speaking in tongues was just for biblical times. It was, was back in those days. It's not for today. Well, Ladies and gentlemen watching here today, boys and girls, if you are tuned in, you are in biblical times. The New Testament didn't end at the, the, the full stop at the end of the book of Revelation. The New Testament is continuing on here today. So all the things that the Bible talks about is still on the table to be had. It's still at the buffet to, to grab you a portion of. We are living in biblical times. So these things that the Bible speaks of, when it comes to tongues that the Bible speaks of, is for today. So those are, those are our three things I want you to, to, to take out of your mind before we jump here into 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and really dive deep on uh, when it comes to tongues. To give you a little context here, this is Paul writing here. He, God sent him to the church in Corinth, which... The church in Corinth kind of had a reputation of being the Wild West of Christianity, that people would just pop off and say and do whatever they want. Uh, and it would be very chaotic and it pushed people away. And God was sending Paul there to lay down some ground rules, to, to ease the unrest and show that I'm not a God of chaos. I'm a God of order and structure here. And that things need to be done in the right way so people don't walk away hurt. And so that's what the, the whole book, of, the two books of Corinthians, I should say. Um, but I feel like especially here in chapter 14, and it draws a great comparison between tongues and prophecy. So let's just dive right in. And I'm going to start here uh, with the first verse. Uh, it says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire. I want to underline eager. I'm gonna, every time we say eager, I want us to underline it eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. So to start off, gifts of the Spirit there, for us, it's four words. In, in, in the, the original Greek, it's one. Now, all you theologians that I'm speaking to and native Greek speakers, please forgive me for what I'm about to, to do and try to pronounce, but it's nevmatica, one word, nevmatica, which was fully meaning is spirituals. 
So we should eagerly desire the spirituals or a more layman's interpretation was what the spirit does. So we should eagerly desire what the spirit does. I think that's so important. And, and if you want, we can go back two chapters to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it lays down what the spiritual does, what the nevmaticas are, what the spirituals are. It says in cha uh, chapter 12, verse 7, Now to each one of you, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another, I'm somewhat cutting some words out here, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another an interpretation of tongues. So these are the, the spirituals, the nevmatica that we should eagerly be de desiring. And so when it comes to tongues, the original Greek word, I'm going to do this a couple of times. The original Greek word is glossa, glossa. And that just means other languages. I, I, I did some research. I heard some people talk about this. Why do they call it tongues? Tongues just sound weird. I'm speaking in tongues. Just sounds weird when it, when it means other languages. Why can't I just say I'm speaking in other languages? That's, that's normal language. When I, I could meet somebody in the street and speak in other languages and oh, it's not so weird. So why do we use tongues? And uh, the answer I found is it's somewhat just traditional mindset. There's no real theological meaning behind it. Um, it's just tradition. So going forward, when I'm reading the scripture here and it says tongues, I'm going to try to inject the word other languages, glossa, in there. So to interchange in our mind, to maybe demystify and de-strangeify tongues when it comes to scripture. Now, what exactly are tongues? Now, I've heard it described as it's a form of prayer and praise expressed to God in a language that you do not understand. And, and to go even further, a man so much smarter than me, so more well-educated, I'm sure, with doctorates to his name in this, N.T. Wright put it as such, tongues refers to the gift of speech which through making sounds and using apparent or even actual languages somehow bypasses the speaker's conscious mind. Such speech is experienced as a stream of praise in which though the speaker may not be able to articulate precisely what is being said, a sense of love for God, a focus, a sense of love for God, of adoration, of gratitude wells up and it overflows. It is a private language of love. I think that's so beautiful. So that it, that's kind of what the tongues is. If that's what the other language is, the glossa is, let's continue on in verse two to, to highlight the importance of tongues versus prophecy here. For anyone who speaks in another language, in a glossa, does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies, this is an old-timey word, edifies, or to construct or to build up. So anyone who speaks in another language builds up themselves but the one who prophesies builds up the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So if I came to you with the physical representation of prophecy and the physical representation of other languages, of the glossa, of the tongues. You want to be reaching for prophecy first. You want, to, you want to reach for both, but prophecy comes first. It's so important because it edifies everyone. If I've used directional language before that our relationship with God is actually 
omnidirectional. You can't have a relationship with God on your own. It's with, it's with the family of believers. So when it comes to the glosso, when it comes to other language, it's this. It's this relationship speaking, as the Bible says, mysteries by the Spirit to God. When prophecy reaches so many people, it builds up so many people when this just builds up the one. And so the five points that I've fully pulled out from that is that, like I said, prophecy is for the people, tongues is for God. The second thing is that language, the language doesn't make sense. It says, indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. So it, it, it might sound strange, but the Bible's covered that. Thirdly, it says, the language is edify the speaker, not the church, the building up. It is not nearly as important as prophecy. You want to reach for prophecy first. And that everybody should speak for glossa. You want, you want to reach for both. You want to prophesy, but you also want to speak in another language. Now we're going to continue on in verse 6. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, now everybody, if I have come to you and speak in another language, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? I love kind of how direct the word is getting there. Like revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or word. It's, there's so much embodied here. Verse 7, it goes on. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the pipe or harp instruments here, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it was, is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone, anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what is being said, I am a foreigner speaking to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner speaking to me. So it is with you, since you are eager, once again, let's underline, eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. Reach for prophecy first. And so, Paul's using a lot of metaphors there. And the first one that he uses is when it comes to instruments. Um, and I've got an instrument right here, actually. Uh, this past Christmas, my wife went to a Christmas party. Uh, and in the crackers, uh, in each one, they popped them. They would have one of these notes. And so you would assemble them all together. And you create a xylophone. And so when it comes to music, you have your notes. Like, oh. I'm not a singer, please forgive me. I'm not a musician, double forgive me. And then you have meter, so the actual song put together. So remember this was Christmas time when this came together, so here we go. Oh, fun. I'm doing very poorly at this. It's supposed to be Deck the Halls, so if that went right, it's a beautiful composition. And think of amazing songs that move your heart and what they can do. And when it doesn't work, it kind of sounds like maybe what I was playing, but maybe even this. It's just kind of noise. It doesn't really make sense. It's kind of off-putting. So if there's not order, if there's not a place if there's not an interpretation, tongues isn't really used for anybody. To go on with the metaphors, he uses the trumpet call for a battle. You have the armies gathered together. You have the church gathered together. And if someone shouts out a trumpet call that doesn't sound right or isn't at the right moment or isn't, it's not done in the right way, the army becomes disjointed and the what was once unified becomes fractured because the call wasn't clear. The command, the instruction wasn't clear. 
And then lastly, he finishes up with speaking in another language. I, I'm currently trying to knock all the rust off of speaking in Spanish. I'm trying Duolingo. I'm friends with Steve Hale. Hey, Steve, uh, who, who's currently uh, nailing it with Chinese. So I'm, I'm just so proud of him for doing that. But if I was continued the rest of this message with Spanish, Buenos dias. Me amo es Dustin. Uh, yo hablo inglés. Muy bien. Uh, yo hablo español. Eh, uh, muy mal. It's, it wouldn't really edify other people. So what's the point? We, we need to understand each other. That's where encouragement comes from, is understanding each other. And that's where prophecy is really great. And so we need, if we speak in tongues, we need the interpretation. Like Spanish, we need an interpreter. Any other language that we don't speak, we need an interpreter. To carry on in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 13, it says, For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. That always you should be praying for what you say. In verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, in a tongue, if I pray in a glossa, in another language, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer, someone who's curious what's going on, who wants to say amen, how can they say amen to your thanksgiving since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. A couple things from, from that passage. It says, if and when you speak in tongues, always, always pray for an interpretation. It, it just builds up. It's helpful for everybody. Number two is that when you speak, your mind's in neutral. Your mind's not edifying God. Your mind's not in the praise position, but your spirit is. Your spirit is connecting with its creator and shouting praises to God and all the amazing things that he's done, but our mind's not engaged. There's somewhat of a disjointedness, a disjointedness there to go on in Corinthians chapter 13. Oh, I'm sorry. It said, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. The Bible goes on to example that the, the idea of tongues um, can be an earthly language. Like in, in Acts chapter two, all these Jews from all over the world came together and they, they were like, whoa, what? That guy's speaking my home language. How does he know my home language? I don't, that guy's never been in my village before. He does, how does he know my dialect? Uh, and the same thing that happens today, I, I know a woman personally that she coincidentally is Greek, uh, is back in America, and she, she just felt so alone. She's like, I don't know anybody else that speaks Greek. I just, what am I doing here, God? Why am I here in Texas? I just wanna go home. And God sent this woman to her in a church service and the woman spoke to her in Greek. That other woman had no idea what she was saying. So it can be these different things. And then also in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it, it somewhat underlines this. If I speak, this is Paul writing again, if I speak with other tongues of men and of angels, so it could be these earthly languages or it's this spiritual heavenly language that we're not meant to understand up here, but our spirit gets. It's all for God. That whatever it is, whatever form, if it's that earthly language or it's a heavenly language, it is a form of prayer and praise to the Most High. In Acts chapter two, when the people are speaking these earthly languages, people come around and they're like, oh, he's speaking my dialect. He's saying praises to God, the amazing, miraculous things God has done. We're going to jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're now in verse 18. It says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. 
Now this is Paul. It seems like he's flexing his muscles here, but there's a point to this. It says, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a glossa, in a tongue, in another language. Brothers and sisters, everybody, stop thinking like children. Paul is saying to these, these, the Corinthians, these Wild West Christians, look, look, I'm not speaking in tongues in front of you. I'm not showing off that I can speak in tongues. That's between me and God. So just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's happening, all right. I speak way more than you guys. So don't think like a child. A child has to see it to believe it. Don't think like that. But I would rather speak five intelligible words than to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, 10,000 here in English, we, we can count up to 10,000, one to 10,000. It may take you a while, but we can get there. But in the Greek, the word there is myriad, which is almost the idea of an unknowable number that's so large. So he would rather speak five words than an infinite number of words in tongues. Five has more value when speaking to the gathering than an endless stream of consciousness for hours and hours to the gathering. So he's continuing to weigh this here. But we need it. We need both. We need the prophecy and we need the glossa. We need the tongues, the other language there. Because it builds us up. It strengthens us. It's, it's the whole point of this, is it strengthens us. And in Romans chapter 8, it says, For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever had a moment where it feels like the world is so heavy? Things are just so dark and bleak. You don't even know what to pray. And maybe I'm just speaking for myself here. I've been there. Time, what do I even say? That's where tongues can come in. That's where the glossa can come in. That my spirit can connect to God in a way that my mind can't in the moment. So that I may be built up by God's love and his encouragement and his strength when I can't even think of the words. That's the value of tongues, the, the gloss of the, other, of the other language. There's so much value there. To continue on, it says, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, everybody? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a gloss, a, a, another language, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. There's a, there's a reason for all this. There's a purpose for all this. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three, very specific there, should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. This is speaking out over the congregation. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. But if there's no interpretation, that's for you and God alone. So at me as a leader of a church, I'll, I will never speak in tongues over a microphone because that's not for them. It, that's, what, that's what the Bible is instructing. When I'm speaking in tongues, it is for my, to build myself up, unless there's an interpretation, and then it, it's to build everybody up. But if I don't have that interpretation, I've got to be quiet and just keep that between me and God. Now that doesn't mean during a time of praise I can't shout my, my other language because I'm speaking to God. We all are in a time of worship. But when it's a time of prayer and we want to stand up and speak out, that's not a time for tongues unless you have an interpretation. It goes on to say, two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. It is for us, ourselves, and God. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager. This is the third underlining I'm doing for this. Be eager to prophesy 
and do not forbid speaking in glossa and other languages, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Let's, let's break the chaos down because it scares people. Let's break the chaos down because it confuses people. This, it's not a confusing thing when it's done right, but when it's done wrong, it's confusing. And so you may be asking, all right, all right, what does that mean for this, me here in the UK, 2024, New Testament? What does that even mean for me? That we are supposed to eagerly desire the gifts time and time again. The Bible tells us we should be eagerly desiring the gifts of God. The, the Nevmetka, my goodness, please let me say this right. The the Nevmetka of God, the spirituals, the Nevmatica, so sorry, the Nevmatica, the spirituals are what the Spirit does. We should be eagerly chasing after it time and time again. All these things, prophecy, interpretation, tongues, the gift of healing, the gift of discernment, on and on. We should be desiring each and every one of these things. Now, we should want it, we should pray for it, we should practice it. But I want to, another reason I don't like the idea of gifts of the Spirit, the way we've interpreted that, is the idea of a gift is you either have it or you don't. You've been given the gift or you don't have the gift. And it, it, it creates like a binary on-off language, like understanding in our mind, and that's not how it is. It's not a you don't have it or you do have it. It's a relationship with God in all the gifts. It's an eagerness thing because the Bible says that it is by the Spirit. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, in verses 11, it says, all these things are the work of one and the same Spirit, talking about God. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So we need to eagerly desire each and every one of them, but it's up to God. It's up to God. So when we're praying, if you've not spoken in tongues, we'll, we'll have a time afterwards to pray about it. And I want you to go off on your own and pray about it. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You're not lesser because of it. You're not less loved by God. You're not less of a member of the body and the family of Christ. God's just not released it to you yet. But it, it's there. It's just, you just gotta give God space. And that's the thing. We have to give God space for this. And to have the courage to let go. Because it can be, it can feel confusing. And with confusion comes anxiety. And with anxiety comes fear and with the fear and is just a mask that pride wears. What if I look stupid? What if I feel stupid? We just have to let that all go. We have to have a time with God to let go and let him guide us in these things, guide us in these nematicas, these ways of the spirit. Because there's no downside of trying this. There's no failure. God's not waiting with a rolled up newspaper. You better get it right or you're getting bopped on the nose. If we pray and it doesn't happen, that's okay. We are still loved. It's not going to reprimand you. You missed the mark, buddy. That's, that's not what it is. That's not God. It's not what the Bible teaches us. And so let's take a moment right here. Where you're at in the room, whether you're alone, whether you're with your family, whether you're with a group of people. God, show us your ways. That I wanna be a person who speaks healing. Father, I wanna be a person who prophesies and builds up the church. Father, I want to be somebody who discerns in the Spirit. Father, I want to be somebody who 
who speaks in other languages, that my spirit speaks in another language. So God, guide my spirit in this. Arrest my flesh, arrest my pride and my fear, my anxiety, my confusion, as I just let my spirit connect with you. And let that glossa flow. God, I thank you for this. I thank you for your spirit that you poured it out on people. It's, it wasn't just for the Jews, it was for everybody. So thank you for that. And all God's people said amen and amen. So please, go, go home. Uh, in an old school way, go to your prayer closet. So I, I do enjoy praying in, in a closet because I, I feel in a private space with just me and God. So go in a private space with you and God, maybe with a, a song playing and let go. And let God's spirit connect with yours. So these ways of the spirit, these nevmaticas, these gifts of the spirit, may flow and strengthen the entirety of the church, the singular and the family, all together. And who knows what God can do with a group that's ready to hear that trumpet call clear and soundly. But that's it for me today, guys. Please tune in next week as we continue on in our series of the Spirit speaking to us. But until then, I'll see you next time. Bye.